Welcome to Medical Marijuana and Wellness. Today's topic is cancer, chemotherapy, and medical marijuana. Joining me today as guest speaker is uh, Amy Green. Uh, Amy, you're an RN with MMTC. Uh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's always great to be here. So my role at MMTC is I do a lot of patient education with both new or experienced cannabis users. So we really drill down into what they're going to be using cannabis for and what um, what areas of education they're lacking in and see how I can help them. Well, I'm sure you've helped a few cancer patients. And so let's, let's talk about cancer. Um, I know there's a hundred different types of cancer, but uh, Amy, what is it? And then once we understand what it is, let's talk about what cancer, what medical marijuana can do to address it. Yeah, certainly. So there are well over a hundred types of cancer and cancer is a group of diseases that involves the abnormal growth of cells. Um, and those cells have the ability to invade or spread to other parts of the body. Now, this is in contrast to something like a benign tumor, which does not have the ability to spread. Now, there are some basic characteristics of what would constitute a malignant tumor. So it's cell growth and division that is absent the proper signals. Um, and those signals would tell the that cell to grow at a specific rate and to die at a specific rate. Um, when you have a malignant tumor, those signals are not getting through. So the cell is growing at an uncontrolled rate. It is dividing at an uncontrolled rate. And it's also forming and producing its own blood supplies and blood vessels. So when you have, um, when you have metastasis, it is that um, those cells spreading to a different area of the body. Um, so it's and, yeah, yeah, and that and that uh, and that that whole process is actually draining the body and uh, of its energy. That's basically what you're doing. You see it as a number of symptoms that are there. Um, what's interesting is medical marijuana has really come a long way as far as our understanding of it. Um, there's something called a ceramide, which I think uh, cannabis really addresses. It does so. Cells normally have a low level of ceramide, and as the cell ages, that, cell, that level of ceramide rises. High levels of ceramide um, contribute to cell death. It's what prompts the cell to go into apoptosis or to cell death. Um, when cannabis or THC interacts with healthy cells, it's not going to change the ceramide levels. But when THC interacts with the CB1 or CB2 receptors, of these cancer cells, it's actually causing an increase in ceramide, which drives cell death. No, well, that's very, very important. We'll see that in just a moment. So how does cannabis fight cancer? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways that THC and CBD can target cancer. The first is it's going to um, cause programmed cell death or apoptosis of those cancer cells. It's going to help inhibit the proliferation or spread of those cancer cells. And it's going to slow tumor growth by preventing the formation of new blood vessels that those cancer um, tumors need to survive. And then finally, it can help stop the metastasis or the spread of cancer to other parts of the body. Right, and a lot of this research has been done outside the United States because here in the United States, it's a schedule one drug and there's no research being done or very little research being done. But really, Israel, Spain, um, and Canada has done a lot of research. So let's see exactly how this works. Let's look at some videos on how these killer T cells work. The green cell you see here is a killer T cell of the immune system, which is attacking the cancerous red and blue cell. You can tell when the killer cell has recognized the cancer cell because the two dots move around and contact the target. The killer cell then spreads out over the cancerous cell. Passing the video through a filter makes the killer cell look yellow and allows us to really see how it focuses on the cancer cell. These killer T cells are constantly hunting down dangerous cells throughout the body and destroying them. You know, it's interesting that there's been, or there is a lot of research being done on killer T cells. And the best way to produce them in your body is a very healthy way by using medical cannabis. So 
what research has been done out there? How do we really know this really works? Yeah, so um, a lot of the research that has been done has been more focused on the symptoms that are caused by either the cancer itself or as a, a side effect of the chemotherapy, radiation, or other therapy that the patient may be having. Um, and so those studies are usually targeting pain, nausea, and weight loss. But beyond just the physical relief that medical marijuana can offer a patient, it has really great psychological benefits because as they are um, not experiencing that pain, nausea, or they're not losing weight, um, they're feeling better, which is just great for feeling great when you're happy. Yeah, I think it, it, it addresses something. a lot of the anxiety and the stress that people are getting when they have cancer, which obviously is, is something that uh, comes part and parcel with it. But also the re these studies are showing how it uh, affects uh, tumors. Yeah, absolutely. So it can help with shrinking existing tumors or slowing the growth of some cancers as well. All right. And that's very fascinating. So if you look, take a look at the various symptoms and you take a look at the um, difference, again, this is a study by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, they found it really helped, medical cannabis helps in a number of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So the big one is uh, that we know about is cancer is a really great at uh, interrupting the signals that are sending pain throughout our body or signaling pain throughout our body. Um, so it is an analgesic, which is pain reliever. It's also opioid sparing, meaning that it's not interacting with those opioid receptors in the body. Um, you have quality control, administration, and dosing. All of these things are super important when you are considering um, using can uh, using cannabis for uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea or vomiting. Yeah, um, and I think also, yeah, I think you look at it how it really complements. Um, how should I say? Since complements really works to get rid of and or manage a lot of the symptoms that people are getting um, are the byproducts of chemotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, those big ones, you know, are uh, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Um, but you can also have a lot of pain that's caused by um, either the cancer itself or the chemotherapy or radiation that the patient is, is receiving. Right. And also cannabis can help a lot with helping you sleep, which is important for patients that are in, in any condition that's being attacked or any medical condition, as well as it affects your mood, which again, is a major part of the whole cannabis uh, cannabis experience as well addressing uh, addressing cancer. Now let's also look at what's interesting is when they did some studies. Again, this is the National Cancer Institute. Sometimes more is not better. They took a look at how much THC a patient needs. Now every person has their own optimi optimal therapeutic dose, but once you find that, using more using going to that particular point helps to combat uh, cancer. But when you go beyond that, it really really doesn't really get rid of the pain. Why don't you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so when you are finding a therapeutic dose, the idea is you want to use the lowest amount possible to receive the effects that you're looking for, but without unwanted side effects. And when using too much cannabis, you can start to have unwanted side effects, you know, that stoned, heady feeling. Um, some people may have a return of the pain, nausea, or vomiting that they were trying to treat in the first place. Um, but yeah, as you said, more is not better when it comes to cannabis. It's about finding that sweet spot that you have the relief that you want, but without unwanted side effects. Right. And every person's body is different. This is one chart of some studies that were done or that was done. But I think it's important to point out your body will tell you when you find that optimal therapeutic dose. You don't need a doctor to tell you that. Your doctors will help guide you in that particular direction there. You can see here that there's some windows of, let's just say, there, there, of, of, of dosage, but your body will be the thing that you need to listen to. It will tell you when you get to that particular point. Now, let's talk about some research that has been done. Uh, one of the people that I really like is Dr. Cristina Sanchez. She's in Spain. When, in 2002, I underline the word 2002, Spain actually built her a facility to do research into medical cannabis and cancer. And she's been doing a number of studies for a number of years and produced a number of studies that are out there. And she's also put together a complete cannabinoid profile. She calls it the entourage, called it the entourage effect. Another researcher that's been doing a lot of work is a gentleman named Rick Simpson. He created something called Rick Simpson oil, or it's called RSO, and sometimes it's called FSO, uh, full spectrum oil. And what he found out was he was trying to 
treat his own cancer, and he found out that high concentrates of this were actually re reduced the amount of cancerous growth and actually caused them to disappear. This is something that's been very, very interesting that's out there. And I think, uh, Amy, you can find RSO in almost every dispensary. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, some companies will call it FSO, full spectrum oil, um, but it, it's really just taking the entire plant, kind of smushing it all together, and you get this very concentrated full spectrum product. So it has all of the original terpenes, flavonoids, and cannabinoids of that original plant just smushed down into this very sticky resinous substance that is excellent for pain control, for nausea. Um, you can use it topically or you can use it orally or sublingually. Sure. And it's interesting over the years, he contributed this to the, really the, to the whole world. He doesn't charge anyone if they want to copy, copy his formula, but there's been thousands of testimonials of patients that have had positive experiences using RSO. There's, again, going back to some research that's been done, this is one of the studies that's very interesting about studies where they've used cannabis and found that it was very effective. Yeah, and so this was actually looking at 207 preclinical articles. So of the articles that were reviewed, about half of them um, it contained original data and were not simply um, reviewing previously collected data. So of the 77 unique case reports described, um, patients were having various cancers, including uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, leukemia, prostate, pancreatic cancer. And about 10% of the cases were in pediatric patients. Now, they showed that about 14% of the cases reported were considered strong, 5% were considered moderate, and the remaining 18% were considered weak. And that's actually just them looking at the strength of the evidence that was collected in those uh, particular papers. But the thing that kept coming up was that using cannabidiol, which is CBD, as an anti-cancer agent in a dose anywhere from 10 to 800 milligrams or uh, delta 9 THC um, in ranges from like four or four to seven milligrams. These two areas are um, very helpful. And so you have separate studies identifying benefits of cannabidiol or CBD and then separate studies looking at THC. But there's really not many studies right now that are looking at both of these uh, compounds together for yeah, the treatment. I think I think in, in a lot of the research that's been done, a lot of the researchers were actually smoking cannabis as opposed to using the tinctures, the oils, and the concentrates. And so what they're doing right now, I know a lot of the research that's being done on cancer and medical marijuana also are using other routes of administration. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there is a lot of research that's out there. And the research that's been done has had all, let's put it this way, points to the same thing, that it really, really helps. Um, let's talk about the statute, the status of research in both the United States and other countries? Yeah, so the biggest thing in the U.S. is obviously cannabis is still a Schedule One narcotic um, as listed by the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. So currently there is not a way for companies, whether it's pharmaceutical companies or universities, to have these trials in the U.S. that focus on cannabis just because it's not allowed. Um, a lot of our research is coming out of Spain, Israel, the UK, Canada, um, and there's actually a lot of it coming out of China as well right now. Yeah, I found that very, very interesting. But the really the bottom line is there's been thousands of testimonials that show that Rick Simpson Oil has helped a number of people. Here in Florida, licensed dispensaries carry RSO or FSO, which I think is very important. And also cancer here in Florida is one of the qualifying conditions uh, to get a medical marijuana card, not just in Florida, but in other states, cancer seems to be one of the uh, qualifying conditions, and it's something to really pay attention to. So cancer and medical cannabis really go hand in hand. So the question is, why is it such a big deal? Um, I tend to look at cannabis as a whole medicine cabinet. It has 450 medical properties, 120 cannabinoids, of which we have six of them shown over here, and it has over 100 different terpenes. The terpenes really give the medical efficacy of the product. But when they work together, it provides something called the entourage effect. Um, give us a quick tip as to what the entourage effect is, Amy. 
Sure. So it's when you combine all of the different parts of the, the cannabis plant. So you have all of the cannabinoids, including major and minor cannabinoids, all of the terpenes, and then all of the flavonoids. So the terpenes and flavonoids give cannabis its smell and its taste. And they're really driving a lot of the beneficial effects that patients actually receive from cannabis. So when you put all of these things together, you have the entourage effect or how they are working in combination with each other. Sure. And so when you take, and this goes into what you were talking about here, again, you get the, the terpenes, which are bringing a lot of the flavor, the, 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 the aroma and the taste, but also the flavonoids combined with the, uh, the cannabinoids, really putting those together and so many of them uh, is really what makes cannabis unique. It has a lot of medical properties and by combining them and using them in, 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 in concert, it really it helps to address a lot of different medical conditions. That's why cannabis is really so effective. If you take a look at, again, putting those together, it helps to be able to create what they call the entourage effect. In other words, one and one is three. Uh, examples, Amy, are like CBD that really helps lessen the psychoactive effect of THC. Absolutely. And it's just the same terpenes help enhance the medical effects of cannabis. Um, and then when you combine THC and CBD together, you really get some powerful benefits. Like CBD on its own is a great anti-inflammatory, but combined with THC, it's really great for anti-inflammatory and pain, and they work better together. Sure. So the question is, why is it such a big deal? Why is cannabis such a big deal, and why are we hearing so much about it? Well, for centuries, we heard about the nervous system. This is where if one part of your body has some sort of a problem, you, you hurt your finger, you hurt your knee, you hurt your foot, it sends a signal to your brain and says, you know, Houston, we have a problem. The question has always been, what does Houston do about it? What we found out when we started studying medical cannabis is our body has an endocannabinoid system. Everybody has it, uh, and any mammal has it. So dogs, cats, uh, as well as humans have this. But the endocannabinoid system is interesting because this is where your body manages pain, anxiety, memory, inflammation, your appetite, your immune system, and it helps your body stay in something called homeostasis. Now, let's talk about homeostasis for a moment because homeostasis is your body in balance. What your body wants to do when you say, I feel good, your body is in balance, and that's because your endocannabinoids are producing the natural medicine it needs to be able to address the situations that are coming up in your body. Now, phytocannabinoids are produced by the cannabis plant. Amy, why, why are they such a big deal? Yeah, so they are structurally identical to the cannabinoids that are naturally produced by our body. And so when you introduce phytocannabinoids from the cannabis plant into our body, it is actually supplementing the system that we naturally have. So that way it can help, you know, with the different processes of um, pain control. It is helping with immune response. Um, it's helping with all of these different systems throughout the body by just supplementing our naturally occurring system. Right. And I know that uh, you wonder why would you use phytocannabinoids? Well, for example, I'm a senior citizen. My body doesn't produce as much or as fast of the endocannabinoids to address any of the problems that it might have. But by having the phytocannabinoids in our body, in essence, it's like a, having recharging our battery giving our body the resources it needs to be able to keep us in homeostasis. Now, we have a couple of well-known cannabinoids, THC and CBD. Amy, what are they? Sure. So THC is the most commonly found product in the cannabis plant. Um, this is what gives cannabis its psychoactive effects, but it's also producing a lot of the non-psychoactive benefits as well, pain control, immune response. And it's mostly going to be interacting with the CB1 receptors, which are in the, uh, the brain and the central nervous system. And then you have cannabidiol or CBD, which can be found in low levels in hemp, or I'm sorry, low levels in cannabis. And then it's also found in hemp. So this is the non-psychoactive part of the cannabis plant. And this actually interacts mostly with the CB2 receptors, which are found in the peripheral organs and the immune system throughout the body. So when you put these together, you're actually interacting with so many different systems throughout the body. And that's really where a lot of the benefit comes from. Right. And it's interesting to point out that if you find a, a, a plant that has 0.3% or less of uh, THC in it, that's referred to as hemp. That's the definition of hemp. Now, 
let's talk about how all this works together. We talked about the entourage effect. This is a great slide. Now, this is just some of the cannabinoids. As I mentioned, there's 120 of them that we know about. But just taking some of them, some of them you can see where, for example, if you're trying to address sleep, there are different properties in each of the different cannabinoids that help with sleep. Same thing with inflammation, same thing with pain, and same thing with cancer. This is a pretty good illustration of how putting the CB1, the CBD receptors, the, C, the THC receptors and their families together really produced what I call that entourage effect. Yeah, and it's just putting those different parts together. Like you said, it's great because you're having these individual pieces that are coming together to address these specific effects. Right, and you can see by the colors, coloration here where the CB1, CB1 receptors are and the CB2 receptors throughout your whole body. But you can see how they all work together. This is the benefit. This is really the magic of cannabis that we're seeing right here. Now, the effects it has on the body is interesting because THC and CBD address the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And as you mentioned earlier, Amy, you know, the CB1 receptors look at the immune system or address the immune system, peripheral organs. CB2 is inflammation, immune response, and peripheral nervous system. But CBD has actually another characteristic to it where it, it, it works with receptors outside of the CB1 and CB2 receptors. It acts like a super vitamin. It does, yeah. And that's why it's really cool. Like it can interact with the 5-HT receptor to help regulate serotonin levels, which are part of your digestive process, um, your blood flow and blood pressure, and then your breathing. Um, it can interact with the A2A receptor, which is part of your inflammation response, your VR1 receptor, which help regulate uh, body temperature and pain, and then the GRP55 receptor, which is part of regulating blood pressure. Right. And these research studies are actually finding that it's affecting even more receptors, meaning it's bringing a healthy response to your body, putting it back into or helping it maintain homeostasis. Let's listen to Dr. Well, my name is Cristina Sanchez. I'm a professor of biochemistry at Complutense University in Madrid, Spain. And I have been working, uh, studying the anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids for the last 15 years. Regarding the amount of THC and CBD that a cancer patient has to take in order to cure his or his, her cancer. Well, first of all, we don't know if cannabinoids cure cancer because we don't have clinical control studies saying that we, we know that they work as anti-tumoral agents in preclinical models of cancer. And we have a lot of anecdotal reports from people uh, saying that they have cured their, cancer, their cancers with cannabinoids. But uh, uh, from the medical community uh, perspective, we don't have that evidence uh, yet that cannabinoids cure cancer. But uh, going back to Dennis's uh, point regarding the, the, the ratio of THC and CBD that one has to take to cure a cancer, I wouldn't say that a one-one ratio is uh, the need. I would say that each individual, each patient needs a particular ratio of cannabinoids or at least that's what we have seen in our preclinical models of cancer. Not only us, but the rest of the research groups that are working on this field. What we see is that uh, some types of tumors, for instance, glioblastoma, brain tumors, in these cases, more THC works better than a one-one ratio. On the other hand, in breast cancer, which is the type of cancer in which I work, uh, we have seen that more CBD works better than a one-one ratio. So I would say that, and this is the case for other medicine, other anti-cancer medicines, uh, each patient is a different situation, is a different clinical challenge. So I wouldn't say that a one-one ratio would work for everyone. I think, again, that's really important because Dr. Christina Sanchez has done a lot well, of work. My name is has done a lot of work in this area. And what she's actually finding out is that it's very personalized. This is where your medical marijuana doctor and your doctor should be working together. And candidly, listening to your body is really, really important. Certain cancers will address or will react to CBD. Certain will react to THC. And it really is a matter of just actually trying the different products that are out there. Now, what should you try? Well, what's happening today in the cannabis world 
is that they're actually producing plants. They're genetically producing plants that are a combination of both the strains and the terpenes uh, with, the, with the cannabinoids. And what's interesting is they're producing what they call cultivars. Cultivars are plants that are designed to have a certain what they call chemical fingerprint to do something. Now, we do know that RSO or FSO is something that really addresses cancer. And you can go to a local dispensary and find different RSO products, indica, sativa, or hybrid. What are the differences between them? Indica is more relaxing and calming. Sativa is more energizing. Hybrid is a combination of the two. But all of these working together will provide something that can really, really help you. And it's a really a matter of really trying it. You will know right away if it's really working, meaning within a week. Try it a couple of days, find what's happening, and what you're going to end up finding out is what will actually work for you, how much CBD you need, and how much THC you need. And you can actually vary that. And again, by we're using some of these FSO products, they bring the whole plant to the product to the party, which really helps you quite a bit. So let's talk about terpenes, because I know here's the most important part of cannabis is really the terpenes and what terpenes you should use. Here are some of the terpenes that are there and some of the research that's been done. Amy, look, tell me a little bit about terpenes. Yeah, so again, terpenes are what give cannabis its smell and its taste, and they're really driving a lot of the benefits of the actual cannabis plant. So from research, the most well-researched and identified terpenes that address cancer are going to be pinene, myrcene, limonene, terpinoline, humulene, and beta-alamine. Um, most of these are going to be major terpenes that you'll find in large quantities in most plants. Some of them are going to be more minor terpenes, such as the terpinoline or the beta-alamine. Um, you'll find those in smaller amounts, but they can still be beneficial even in smaller amounts. Now, looking at the actual incidence of cancer in the U.S., I mean, the U.S. is looking at like 1.7 million new cases of cancer every year, and almost 600,000 Americans die from cancer every year. It's something that we really should be here in the United States. We should be paying attention to medical cannabis, as well as T-cell um, T cell um, studies, because these working together, we know are very effective in addressing cannabis excuse me, addressing cancer. And we know that, again, cannabis is the most natural way to help the T cells produce within your body and address cancer. But these terpenes are really, really important. When you go to the dispensary, ask the person behind the counter what's in the product. Again, if you're using FSO, the free or RSO products, they'll have the complete complement of all of, the, all of the terpenes. If you're looking at individual types of products, you may want to just make sure that these types of products, these terpenes are there to really provide the relief that you're looking for. And here's an example of the, and we're going to provide this, we're not going to go through this chart, but we're giving you a chart that really explains the terpenes, the effects, the cultivars it's found in, and, how, and the temperature of which it works within uh, when you're using a, uh, a cannabis device, especially for flour. Now, this is important. It's something that we're giving you so you can print it out. You can take a look at it. It'll be in the follow-up material. But it's really, really important to know that there's been research. We know that terpenes work, and we know that can be effective. Now, Amy, it's always interesting. People always say to me, well, maybe I should just go smoke a joint, and it'll just work. Uh, there are other routes of administration. There's other ways of taking cancer. Uh, let's start with flour. Let's talk about that. Let's go have a blunt and see if it works. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so... There are lots of different ways that patients can use medical cannabis, and there are lots of ways that do not involve inhalation. So you have your sublingual route. That's usually going to be tinctures that you'll put under your tongue. You usually leave them in your mouth for a minute, swish it back and forth, and then go ahead and swallow it. Those can be very effective because you can get some onset, um, some action from them in just a couple minutes, and that's from the sublingual absorption under your tongue. And then you have products like sprays, very similar, very quick onset as well. Then you'll have oral products like capsules or edibles. These are going to take longer to take effect. And for these products, I always recommend that you make sure you're waiting at least an hour and a half to two hours before you take more. Just make sure you're giving it time to work before you take any more. And then you yeah, have- And I think we should point out that onset means when I take it, how long before I begin to feel the effect of it, duration is how long will it work. 
I know that sublingual drops are, again, in the category of 20, 15 to 20 minutes and four to six hours, but oral products last 10, four to 10 hours. But as you mentioned, they take a while to work. It may take up to two hours. And the famous thing about edibles, again, you get into the gummies, the lozenges, the, the brownies, the cookies. Uh, about the time you don't think they're working and you take another one is about the time it starts working. And that's where the famous uh, stories of people taking too much cannabis come from. So really pay attention, especially with oral products. Be cool. Take your time. Wait an hour or two before you take some more because you just really don't want to take too much. As we mentioned earlier, too much THC isn't going to help you sometimes, but being able to find that therapeutic uh, that therapeutic dose is really going to help you quite a bit. But in the case of, of of cancer and in many pain conditions, topicals are pretty popular, aren't they? Absolutely. And it's mostly because um, most of the topical products are going to be just localized relief to wherever you put them. So you wake up, your knee hurts, put some on your knee. It's only going to help your knee and it's not going to give you any stone heady feeling at all. Now, some topicals do actually go into the bloodstream. And I would just say, be aware of how much you're using then um, in case you're using other cannabis products that are going to add cannabinoids to your system on top of that topical that is going into your bloodstream. I would always just make sure you ask at the dispensary if this will go into your bloodstream or not with topicals. And then you have transdermal patches. These are actually meant to be worn for any, anywhere from usually eight to 72 hours. And they're very nice because they're going to give patients a low continuous dose for that entire period of time. And it is meant to go into your bloodstream though. So you just have to make sure that it is a dose that you're comfortable using. Yeah, it goes not just on the skin, but also will penetrate through the skin into your bloodstream. And that's the yes. difference between them. Yes. Now, inhalation is fun because a lot of people as they talk about, well, I'll just smoke a joint. And what they don't realize is when you take that blunt, take that joint, put that 500 degree flame up to that joint, you're burning off most of the cannabinoids, most of the terpenes, and most of the flavonoids. You're reducing the medical efficacy of that particular blunt or product um, down about 60%. That's the bad news. The good news is it still works. In other words, how can you run an engine sometimes at 40% and still get some effects? Flour will work, but there's a better way of taking flour. If you really want to inhale the product, that's where concentrates come into play. But then concentrates allow people to be able to, or allow the uh, dispensaries to be able to produce a flour product in a concentrated version that produce, protects and produces the, the terpenes. Tell us a little bit about that, Amy. Yeah, so concentrates are available in many different forms. And once a patient is using concentrates, um, just like the name suggests, they are very concentrated forms of THC. Um, but they're also going to have, depending on the, how the product is produced, it's also going to have all of the terpenes and flavonoids that that plant originally had. So at, at the point where you're using concentrates, it's just about picking the ones that you can work well with the texture and the effects work well for you as well. Because yeah. they come in shatters, they come in distillates, they come in rosins, they come in butters, a lot of different things. You can either put them into a concentrate pen, meaning you can load them into the top of a, a pen. The pen usually has three or four different temperature settings to be able to bring out the right terpenes. Remember we talked about some of the, we pointed out some of the temperature settings. The right temperature setting will bring out the terpenes. And, but also um, you can actually dab it, and that's another way of actually just dabbing into it. And I'm not going to get too much into that right now. There's a, a routes of administration video that we did. Please pay attention to that or go back and look at that if you're looking at that type of route of administration. But I'm a big believer in concentrate pins rather than flour because it gives me the terpene profiles. It gives me the health benefits that are there. And if you don't want to load your own concentrate pen, you can actually buy a vape pen from the dispensary themselves. Yeah, and as long as you're getting uh, vape pens that have a terpene profile, that's exactly what you want to look for. And some of the vape pens that you can get have terpenes up to six, seven, up to 10%. So it can be very, very beneficial. Sure. And so, by the way, I should point out, there's been some negative things about vape pens come out a couple of years ago. Those were vape pens that were not tested. They were not uh, vape pens that had followed any certifications by either the state or the manufacturer itself. In fact, it was a third party. Asian manufacturer that came into the United States sold into head shops. Uh, the products that you buy from state registered and licensed dispensaries have been tested twice by the dispensary itself and one by a third party firm. So 
you're safe to use a vape pen from a dispensary. Uh, in fact, in many cases, it's something that really helps a lot of patients. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because the onset is almost immediate. Right. And that's the key. I know that's, I use it for pain and it's amazing how fast it really helps me. So let's talk a little bit about dosing. I know that we talked about it earlier. We talked about, you know, how much do you take? Well, every person is different. I know that when you take a look at alcohol or caffeine, you know, in some cases in alcohol, some people can take, you know, one drink and they're kind of done for the night. And some people can drink the whole bottle and just be getting started. But really, you need to find how much THC your body can tolerate. And you can do that by using what they call the therapeutic range. Tell me a little bit about dosing, Amy. Yeah, so the biggest thing with dosing is you're trying to find that specific dose that works well for you, that's meeting your needs, so it's giving you the effects that you want, but without unwanted side effects. The unwanted side effect that most people are trying to avoid is that stoned, heady feeling. So ideally, we actually never want you to get to that point where you have that stoned, heady feeling, uh, because we want to try and find that sweet spot before you actually get there. Sure. And so the idea is go low and go slow. Start with a little bit of the product. Try that out. Uh, usually people will start with a one on one to one product, like a sublingual. They'll use like 0 0.25 um, milliliters, the first or second line on the, on, the, on the dropper. Do that for a day or two. You may feel little or no relief. Then up the quantity. You'll begin to, begin to feel your relief uh, from the uh, effects uh, or that condition, relief from the condition that's there. If you begin to use a little, as you up that, that dosage, what you're going to begin to do is you may begin to feel some of those unfavorable side effects. And when you do that, go back down. Once you go back and you, again, if you have a one-to-one -one product and you find that therapeutic range, it works, you can increase the amount of CBD. In other words, you can buy a, what they call a ratioed product. So rather than being one-to-one, -one, you could use a two-to-one or a four-to-one. In the case of my wife, she uses a nine-to-one and a 12-to-one, 12 CBD to one THC product to adjust her particular condition key, your body is going to tell you when you're in this particular range in here. Now, a doctor is going to give you a formula. There really isn't something that really can help you with that. It's really unique to each individual person. Certainly. What Oh, sorry. Uh, the one thing that I absolutely suggest is journaling, um, keeping a record of how much you're using, when it's working, if it's working for the symptoms that you're trying to treat. Um, and then if you would continue to use that product, you really kind of have to reflect on how it did for you and if there's anything that you would change. Right. And by the way, we have a dosing video that's in our YouTube library. You may want to check out. It can really help you be able to dial in. Dosing is the key to using medical marijuana effectively. So we've gone over a lot about cancer in medical marijuana. Uh, let's talk about the bottom line. Uh, Amy, is it safe? It is absolutely safe. There is no possible chance that you can overdose on cannabis. The worst thing that happens is you get very tired, very hungry, or you have that stoned, heady feeling. All of those things go away with time. Or you can take some CBD, just plain CBD, and help bring down those symptoms um, sooner. Sure. And that's really, really important. You are in control. If you're taking medical cannabis and you begin to feel uncomfortable, I Get, get some CBD by itself, take an equal amount of CBD to the product that you're taking, and it'll help you regulate or have you get back off of that anxiety or that heady feeling that you have. So you are in control. And I think that's really, really important. And also you can help and find your own relief. You don't need to have other, let's just say doctors tell you what's there. The doctor doesn't know how your body feels. Your body will tell you. Trust me, in my particular case, I knew when I was getting relief. I think also, um, Amy, you can't get addicted. No, and that's really the great thing about cannabis. Unlike opioids or um, benzodiazepines like Xanax, um, there is no physical addiction to the cannabis plant. Um, so patients are able to increase or decrease their dose based on how they're feeling. And if they do want to decrease suddenly or stop suddenly, there's not going to be any withdrawal symptoms from stopping. Sure. And again, as we pointed out by Lockheed talking about routes of administration, uh, there's more than one way to take it. You don't need to smoke it. And I think that's really, really important. So wrapping up, I should say thank you, everybody, for watching this particular video. I hope that it's helped you uh, address or answered a lot of your questions about whether medical cannabis is an option uh, for, can for cancer. Uh, we would like to be able to naturally point you to our YouTube channel 
where you can get other videos, this video and other videos on how medical cannabis can help naturally tune into the uh, medical marijuana and aware webinars that can help you be able to address again, get more information on how to address a lot of different situations. Amy, any final thoughts? Uh, just start low, go slow. Consider using a ratio product of THC to CBD and just keep track of what you're using and how effective it was for you. Right. And I, my final thought is um, it, we know it works. I've seen a number of patients use medical cannabis to address cancer. Uh, like any pharma drugs, it's not 100%, but it is an option. It has worked, and it is something that brings a lot of relief, both for the pain, the anxiety, and the stress. So I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please uh, check out our YouTube channels and our, and our medical marijuana webinars, and thank you very much.